Yeah, yeah, the beats are one thing, but when you're actually ripping off like the whole section of songs. Yeah. Are we on? Yeah. Yeah, tag you. I did tag you. Uh, you just do you want to? I think you did just now. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. You need the notes? I got a, a print out here. Alright, big show today, people. We can see everybody. It might be too high up. It's too high up. Open up like a open up halfway. Uh. Alright, get it together. Oh, right there. All right. That looks good. Another episode of The Rock Show. Coming right up. Yep. Cheers. Good? Everybody's good, all right? We might have to talk a little now, but yeah, we'll be fine. You might have to talk loud because you're farther away. You got a lot of music here. In I the gotta background. get my notes on too. Yeah. International is rocking right now. <laughs> we are at the International American Bar, First Avenue between Sixth Street and Seventh Street. All right. All right. We're going to do a show today about Beastie Boys. A lot of people ask about this. People have been asking us to do it. So, you know, we're all, about, we're all about the fans. And we're all going to try to fuck it up as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Who asked me if I shaved my head? How does this look like a shaved head, you fucking idiots? Huh? Who was that? Who was that? It's <laughs> Dan, you drunk on the porch, oh, motherfucker. <laughs> That's an inside joke. <laughs> Dan's getting drunk on his porch again. I just can't comment on it. <laughs> um... We all ready or what? Hello and welcome to another edition of The Rock Show and today it's episode 39. Next one is 40. Wow. What are we doing for the 40th episode? Uh, GBH. GBH. Oh, yeah, the shit. hardcore band. Yeah, that's wow, that's going to be hard. Really going to be hard. So right now, um, today we got a special show and we're talking about the Beastie Boy. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a little different. Uh, we haven't really gotten into the rap thing too much. Uh, probably won't get deep into it, but... As far as the Beastie Boys go, uh, we got uh, Darren Bennett right here. Uh, good, uh, big fan of ours since the beginning. You've been very supportive. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, he had asked me if we could do a show on the Beastie Boys because it's one of his favorite bands. And, uh, you know, I thought about it and I said, yeah, you know, we could do that. They're New York guys, and they started in the punk hardcore scene, and they were snotty and obnoxious and all yeah. that shit. So, yeah, definitely, why not? Um, I was always kind of like back and forth with this band, but it's not about what I like. We're going to talk about this band because they're very important. Um, like I said, they started off in the hardcore scene, uh, basically in the early... Late 70s, actually. Yeah. They, had, uh, they started in 78, 78 actually. 78, right, right. They had a band called the uh, Aborigines, the, uh, the Young Aborigines. Young okay. Aborigines. And they were, you know, a punk band influenced by all the 70s punk bands that were out there. Uh, you had Mike D on vocals, you had MCA on bass, a guy named John Berry. John Berry, yeah. 
and a girl named Kate Schillenbach on drums. Now, they were practicing, learning everything, and there was another band at the same time called um, The Young and the Useless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great name. Okay. And uh, Horowitz was in that band, Adam Horowitz. Yeah. He was the uh, lead singer. Now, at one point in uh, the early 80s, this would all kind of, these two bands would kind of come together. Yeah. A couple of these But you know what, like, um, uh, Mike Diamond, yeah. he was in a lot of other bands before. He was like in a band called Band. He was in yeah. another, like, yeah. jazz. Like, he was in a he, bunch of bands. Right. He was a musician. Right. Well, he played drums. Yeah. So he's he, in a lot of other bands. Like, yeah. He's yeah. 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 And he, you know, he could play jazz, fusion jazz, all kinds of shit. Um, they would all come together by 1982. They were going to release an EP, and that was called Pollywog Stoop. Yeah, as the Beastie Boys. Now, do you know what the Beastie Beastie stands for? It stands for something. It's an antonym for something else. What is it? Now, before I say what it is, is there any controversy with that? Or is it really just one thing. Okay. All right. So it stands for boys entering anarchistic states. Towards inner excellence. Yeah, inner excellence. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Wasn't sure if it was like three or four different stories. <laughs> but that's cool. You know what's the crazy thing? Acronym, so. yeah. They sold in the United States. They sold 26 million albums. Yeah. Worldwide, they sold 50, 50, 50 million albums worldwide. Can you take about three guys from three Jewish guys from Brooklyn that can rap? Yeah. Cyrus in high school. You can't yeah. make this shit yeah. up. I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> Only in New York could that happen. Only in New York. You know. Um, there was a, a record store back in the day on 9th Street near 2nd Avenue called Rat Cage. Yeah. Okay, and I remember this place. And the Beastie Boys hung out there. That was a couple years before I was hanging out, but but they were hanging out there. And it was kind of like a refuge, you know. And and the owner to the place made a label called Rat Cage Records. That was one of the that and was that, one of the first labels. Right, that was one of the first labels they were involved with. Um, the 80, 1982 EP called Polywog Stoop was recorded at the uh, 171 Avenue A, which is where the Bad Brains recorded. Uh, guys from the Pearl Max used to hang out there. It was, you know, it was I mean, spot. it was the who's who's of it was like a, everybody a, a, was. A yeah, you know, that was a spot that, you know, punk kids could hang out, get something to eat, chill out, you know, and, and listen to some music. Um, it was recorded there. Now, uh, at that point, they had uh, Ad Rock, Adam Horowitz, in the band. Okay, from Young and the Rest. So that was the lineup. But uh, this was when they, they started doing some different shit. They, started, they did an experimental uh, yeah. hip hop album. Well, it was it was really one song, and it was called Cookie Puss. Okay? <laughs> That's a great day. That's for a great anybody, day. for anybody that doesn't live in New York, doesn't know what Cookie Puss is. There's a, a chain of ice cream stores called Carvel, you've probably heard of, and there's a cake you can buy called the Cookie Puss. It's been around forever. And what they did was, they actually prank called. Yeah, it was uh, they prank, yeah. The, 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 the song itself, you can YouTube it, listen to it if you don't know it. It's a prank call. It's a joke call. Yeah. Okay? And there's like a beat over it and everything, and they're just like fucking with this person in the club. <laughs> it's right? great. They're it's fucking great. Yeah, you know, yeah, and, and people, you know, love this for some reason. And you know what you gotta understand too is in, in the early eighties. I think they got like a little shit put. They got a little no, no, lawsuit. They no, got, no, 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 there was no lawsuit for but that. Were, but 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 they they, they got some shit. They caught shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carvel get well. You know, Tom Carvel was still alive then. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Carvel, hi, I'm Tom. You crank calling my story, yeah, you fucking little motherfuckers. I'm in the mafia. <laughs> Shut up, you fucking cooking push motherfucker. <laughs> Fudging the well. <laughs> you know that cooking was just fudging yeah. the world well back yeah, then. Like yeah, flip over. It's the same, it's it's the the same, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, cookie puss has what? The, the cone for a nose? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I used to eat cookie pusses every week when I was a kid, man. It was like my it's family. fucking great. Yeah. But... You know, people like this record. It was, it was, uh, it was something different. And it was in, 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 in the punk hardcore days, there was a connection between the early hip hop bands like Run DMC, Grandmaster Flash, the Beastie Boys, and the hardcore punks. A lot of, a lot of people crossed over and liked both. I knew people that 
who hated rap, but yeah. I also knew people that totally embraced it. You yeah. know, I thought, yeah, and I, I kind of liked it. It was, it was, it was street. It was they were talking about a, a good message. But the way they okay. did it was very different. They it was different more, than they, it is were, now. they were more like a party thing. You know, they they actually. Oh, you mean were, the Beastie Boys? The Beastie yeah. Boys were very yeah. different than everybody else. They, you know, because they like they, 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 like they, like uh, no sim to Brooklyn. You know. Like that's pretty much it's about you staying, not sleeping in Brooklyn, staying up all night. Well, li- License to Ill, we'll get into it in a minute. And, but and li- I mean, li- li- License to Ill was a party record. Oh, that was a yeah. different party. That was yeah, I mean, absolutely. No, that was a party anthem. Well, anthem and every song on yeah, the was an anthem, basically. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, what they did was right after Cookie Puss came out, um, they ended up connecting with Rick Rubin, who was going to be their DJ. Yeah. They, need, they needed the DJ. And he was at a student at NYU at the time, uh, Russell Simmons, who was actually his buddy. Yeah. The two of them started Def Jam Records. Yep. Okay, label. And uh, they would sign the Beastie Boys. Rick was the DJ for a while and produced stuff by them. Uh, but there was a record called uh, Beastie Groove. You know this one? And Rock Hard. Okay? Yeah. Now this was like a 12 inch that they put out. Yeah. Rock Hard sampled Back in Black by ACDC. Okay? And in the, you know, in the mid 80s, this was a time when rap was really kind of coming together and there was a lot of bands that would sample music. You still hear it today, it's a little bit different now. You know who got in trouble for doing that shit? Fucking well, they did. Vanilla Ice too. Oh, Vanilla Ice. Vanilla Ice was, the Vanilla Ice was a thief. <laughs> <laughs> he was a straight up thief. Okay? I remember when he tried to explain the Queen song. He's yeah. like, yeah, are you kidding me? Okay, yeah. Right. Like you didn't rip that off. Um, so, Mike, yeah. you're talking about, so these guys are starting it out. They went from a punk group to now a rap. How yeah. many times that has that happened with them? That's like a huge, yeah. that's a huge exactly. different gender. I don't, I don't think anybody I know has done. I see people go you know, and start punk and then maybe start doing rock and roll. I think, I think these guys were looking to make it any way they could and when the cookie puss thing that was which great. was kind of like a spoof really it was a prank call but it was also like are they really like because the rest of the stuff wasn't hip hop okay they, they did this and it's like okay well this works let's let's keep going with this yeah. Right? I mean, yes. And one other song that was on that sheet, the uh, follow-up too, yeah. was actually a song called Beastie Revolution. Oh, that, right. Oh, yeah. Right, Revolution. right, right. That was, I mentioned the ACDC, like, sample. Yeah. They actually ended up getting a snippet from the uh, Beastie Revolution sample about their ambition by British Airways. Oh, yeah. They showed them. Yeah. They showed them. Oh, yeah. They got $40,000. Right. You know, so that was in the that was around that time. And that gave it the seed money to be like, okay, so probably, got, that was studio money. <laughs> yeah, so probably nobody thought they would even come. Yeah. And, so, and they actually, the money that they were able to get, they were able to find like a, a place in Chinatown that became like their like recording studio there to rehearse. Yeah. So they kind of like got that in front of some like seed money when they were kind of keeping the fucking hip hop live at the same time. So that, that's that's amazing. Yeah. That yeah. really is yeah. what. Took that little stamp uh, uh, yeah. off a no, off, off a nobody man. Oh, yeah, but these boy. motherfuckers did it too, and they actually got away with it. They did it to guy like Newton, James Newton. Yes, 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 yes. And it's almost the same fucking thing. <laughs> that was like a funk. Right. Yeah, but it was like a, it was also like a, something like a six bit, six seven yeah. fruit or whatever it was. And I think a lot of it speaks to about like the nature of sampling, like what it was back then versus what it was now. Like we were talking about before, yeah. you couldn't make a lot of the records that the Beastie Boys made. Right, now you couldn't do it now. It just way too much money. Yeah. Oh no, you have to. There was lawsuits money for through the nineties that set precedent as to how you handle yeah. sampling. So it's like, yeah, you can never do it. Them getting for only $40,000 would be like getting $40 million. Now, yeah. Now, yeah. And uh, to this day, it's like even in MCA as well, you cannot use the PC Boys for any advertising. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. Yeah, but they use them in movies all the time. Like, you know, that's our track. He doesn't, yeah. he, doesn't, he doesn't want them in commercial. They're not, they're not, as long as they're not being used to like, promote a product. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that was in it as well. Yeah. Um, in 1985, they would open for Public Image Limited. Yeah, that's right? another weird right? John, yeah. Johnny Lyons yeah. band. And they opened for Madonna on a North American Virgin tour. 
Now, one thing I got to mention with this is um, they would also get involved with Run DMC, who was on, yep. I think, the same label. Yes. And you'd have the Race in Hell tour as well yep. after the Madonna tour. But they tour. also did it too, like with Fishbone and a yep. whole bunch yep. of other yep. people. And Murphy's, Law. Murphy's Law. So these yep. guys, you know what? It's, it's, a, it's a rap group, but these Murphy Law, those things, they're not rap. Murphy Law is the punk band. Which yeah. is amazing that yeah. they still hang out. Like, they got a lot of, years, years I think they got a lot of support from the punk community. Yeah. Just, people are they, rock they, in they general. Did. They kind they of drag that ethos into yeah. hip hop. Yeah. Yeah. That that DIY kind of like mentality, uh, a little bit of noxiousness, which, which into is like it, yeah. you know. which is like still what hip hop began as, but it like you know they were a little they weren't like necessarily part of like the golden generation of the grandfathers of this hip hop genre, right. right? But they were kind of like a little bit of a reset as like rap became more like R&B, you know, towards yeah. the late '80s, like these cats like. Back to the roots. Back to the roots. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. The Raisin Hell tour would be with Run DMC yeah. and uh, yeah. Houdini and LL Cool J. Yeah, okay. that's a that's very early hip hop yeah. tour. But that's a hip hop. That's, 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 that's a hip hop. That's a hip hop tour. I would love to see it. They had gotten DJ Hurricane at that point. Okay, as a DJ. Hell of a DJ. And they were, at the same time, they were starting to get recognized. Remember the Crush Groove movie? Yes. Okay, they had a song called She's On It. Yeah, yeah She's On It, that's right. right. That was like their okay. first video. That was their first video, right. I think it was their first video. She's right. On It! Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Now, you also Very had the Paul, the Paul Revere 12 inch. Paul Revere was out, great. And that was before License to Hill. Yeah, that was great. Album. But in, uh, where am I at? Okay. 1986, November 15th, they released License to Hell. Okay, I was in my son. But they had a single before they released that? Was there a single album? Uh, there, there, was like, the album? there was actually four singles, I think, or three singles, even before Fight for the Right to Party. Yeah. Which I didn't realize, I didn't remember that. I always thought Fight for the Right to Party was the first single on the album. It wasn't. So I don't know if there was a build up. Maybe there was no sleep to Brooklyn. I mean, I think, right? There's no sleep to Brooklyn before Fight for Your Right? I think no sleep to Brooklyn. It could was. be. And then I think Fight for Your Right came later on. Oh, no, that, that kick, when that came out, that kicked the door open. I mean, oh, everybody that was great. That. But, I, but they, you know, you, I knew of them before that, but I don't know if it was stuff from that out. I can't remember. But. What they did was that in November they released that that album. Now Rolling Rolling Stone magazine to me has one of the best like labels ever of that album. Yeah. <laughs> they just said three idiots create a masterpiece. Yes. Yeah. You know what's funny? And, and I remember so when I'm reading, I remember reading remember that, that right? in Rolling yeah. Stone magazine. You know what's funny? These guys are also in the hall in the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It was right after MCA, MC. Uh, MCA died. No, it was right before. I mean, it was, yeah, right, it was before. Like right before. It was literally like a, a year before. And then before. he died. I yeah, mean, he died that, not that long after. And it was like, holy shit, but he got he got into that before. But why did they pick them? But then when you look at the crew, like they had like seven platinum records. These guys had some fucking well, big hits. I yeah, were, I, I mean, they were kind of the first to, that there was still like a pure rock and roll bias with the thing. Yeah. Because like, you know, like now, now yeah. like, you know, I, I don't really give a fuck about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I've said that a million times. Yeah, <laughs> but you know the fact that the fact that they're in there, I don't really have a problem with. I guess, but um, this was the first rap record to go to number one. Yep. in the genre at all by anybody. Yeah. Okay, spent five weeks there and it sold nine million copies for a brand new label called Def Jam. Def Jam, yeah. Was that? Yeah. Was a diamond record? Yeah. Like, yeah. Multiplied. Multiplied. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Fight for Your Right to Party went to number seven in the Billboard charts, and the video was a huge hit. That video was great. I think, I think that was a time when, you know, MTV was at its peak, and, you know, if you had a, a, a video that was so hot, it would sell the song. That video was hot. It wasn't the, uh, I forget his name, but the guitarist the Slayer actually yeah. played the riff. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, let me ask you a question. So, so look at these guys, just before even the first album, they were already touring with McDonald's. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they <laughs> Think about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, they really, they really out of, the gate, out of the gate. They were huge. Yeah. Out of the gate. They, they were doing something that nobody was doing. Um, but one thing, too, is you got to mention with that fucking tour, okay? Um, well, the tour that's coming up with the license to Hill. Yeah. Okay? It was off the hook. Yeah. When they started touring that album, they 
the, the, the set considered, c consisted of women in cages, okay, a 20 foot inflatable penis, <laughs> okay, and you know, they weren't watching their language and stuff. They oh, no, they did not give a fuck. Okay. I think they're like but the, but like the, problem, the problem with all of that is that their fan base was 11 year old girls. <laughs> So, you know, with their parents taking them to the show, okay? And so, you know, here you are with your daughter and there's a giant 20-foot penis on stage. You know? Mommy, what's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. where you're going to get later on in life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about this in a couple of years. A couple of years. You know, but um, the band got into all kinds of trouble on that tour. There was a lot of rowdiness, a lot of riots. Uh, they actually were accused of uh, provoking the crowd and causing riots on stage. Adam Horowitz got arrested in Liverpool, England, uh, because a riot had broken out, and he ended up getting arrested for assault or something like that. Um, it just, you know, was, was fucking insane. You know what, what, what was another group that had that kind of problem? NWA had a problem that they would yeah. tell them that they would start rioting, and they were like, fuck them. It was like, oh my god, that was crazy. You know, that was, they even, that was a few years later. They even yeah. told them not to play that song oh, "Fuck the Police" in a few of their shows, and they did it anyway. And they did it anyway. <laughs> what, what, Public what Enemy, they? Public Enemy had problems. Too. Oh yeah, Public yeah. Enemy too. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would happen is uh, the, the insanity of that tour, the whole whirlwind of it. Basically, they decided to part ways with Rick Rubin. Yep. Also, Rick Rubin, my opinion had like a little bit of a God complex because he was saying to them... You're speaking the past tense. Uh, well, yeah, no, 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 I guess he still does. Um, but he went on record saying like, you know, I made them. Yeah. And, you know, after the reason they were huge, which they didn't take too high. No, they made them tough. Fuck that. Them, those guys work tough. hard. Those now, guys. Rick, Rick Rubin, I appreciate he's caught he's caught lightning in the bottle a couple of times. Yeah. Okay, but you know, to say that he made the Beastie Boys, I think is a stretch. You know, um, they were involved with the soundtrack to the movie Tougher Than Leather in 1988. Okay, and that was a movie that featured Run DMC and the Beastie Boys, and it was all about the reason they held for Yeah. Uh, at that point, though, when they left Def Jam, they would sign with Capitol Records. Yeah. Now, they re-entered the studio in 1988, and they were ready to do something a little more mature. They were, I think they were getting a little sick of the fight for your right to party, you know, mentality. Uh, party album type thing and they would do something now now it's their second album bands no matter who you are whatever genre there's that sophomore jinx right sophomore slump and you always got to be concerned about that but it happens but you know what i love i love paul paul paul's routine i thought i would i think that's one of the best albums but everybody says that i think that's one of the best that's why i in the jukebox here i didn't if people point to an album that's like their masterpiece it's that Okay, but in 1989 when it came out, no one thought that. No one was thinking that. It only saw two million albums, I think. Right, right. The song "Hey Ladies" was a top. Hey lady. Yeah, that was fun. That was a top forty hit. Okay, uh, they brought in a, uh, uh, guys called the Dust Boys to produce it, which were kind of like up and coming hip hop producers. Dude, the Dust Boys are fucking good. Yeah. Yeah. If you have to look at the Dust Boys, but you know what's funny is like the album still got to number fourteen. Yeah, not bad for a second. Not bad for a second. That's fucking good. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you know, they, they're saying the Beastie Boys expected it to go to number one. So that, you know, in, 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 the, in the mythology of them, it's a failure. It's not real. You know what probably happened was probably what happened was the kids that heard the first album wanted the same guy the album. Yes, exactly. They heard this. I thought oh, this is the bad. It's totally different. It's totally different. Talking and more about beats, and more about lifestyles, about yeah. that hanging. Now they fucked up, yeah. you know, and all this stuff. But it was, I, I thought Paul Boutique was, to me, that's that's a master, that's a fucking fucking masterpiece. Not only that, they re, they actually remastered, re, they broke yes. out the album two thousand nine. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Now that album, they were kind of, yeah, you know, number fourteen. I'd say is still pretty commercial. Yeah. Okay, but maybe not in their world. You know, they wanted it a little bit better. But they started to said, okay, we got to come out with another. They would tour behind that album. Yeah. But they, they would say, okay, we got to come out with something else. Now, nineteen ninety two would be the album. Check your head. 
Check your head with another girl. Yeah. Now, this was one where they started. Right, we're going to go back to our roots a little bit. And we're actually going to play some instruments. Yeah. Because people, I think probably people didn't even realize they could play instruments. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, guitar, bass, and drums. You know, they went back to that. And that album would go to number 10 on the Billboard charts. It had that single, So What You Want. So what, what, you, what You Want, You What You Want. want. That's a great song. Okay. Another great song. song called Pass the Mic. All Pass the Mic. All that would be. It's like a great video, too. Yes. yes. Pass the Mic started, was the one. making like really good music videos on this album. Yes. yes. Pass yes. the Mic's the one that got them into a little bit of trouble? Is that the one that they, they changed due to? No, right? Or am I thinking the wrong album? Sabotage got censored. Sabotage. Yeah, but that was just for the content. To me, Sabotage is one. I love song. that. I love that show. Now, what they did on this album was interesting too, because they actually went even further back and acknowledged their punk roots with a song called "Time for Living." It was a hardcore band back in the early '80s called Frontline. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And they actually covered one of their songs, oh, yeah. which was, I mean, fantastic. I mean, it was probably yeah. The, so it was for, 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 for Frontline members. It must have been huge. Pastor Mike got sued for that little six second food sampling that they put in there from James Newton. And then the judge was like, this is fucking bullshit. <laughs> Pretty much threw the case out. <laughs> but they also, but they say they also told him they can never do that again. Like they can't, you know, they have to, yeah, they won. So they got, they, 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 they won, and they won. But they got to you know, these little things was always pissing off Capitol Records. Right. Okay, little things they did over the years. Now, this album is considered a precursor to bands like Limp Bizkit and stuff that would come at the end of the decade. Oh, they all, that, that, they all that, copy that, that style. Yeah. Right yeah. Uh, but they were, you know, the Beastie Boys, a lot of their career, they were five years ahead of the curve. Oh, yeah. You, know, if you just look at the history, you're like, yeah, they were, they were doing stuff that... Five years later, got huge. Yep. Yeah. So you gotta hand it to him. So, guys, I gotta tell you, I went to um, that um, the family family uh, reunion tour, yeah. the family tour that they did with Run DMC in Madison Square Garden. What, year, what year was that, Rob? That was like '87 August. I remember because my dad wanted me to get that fuck out of the house. He <laughs> gave me like something like 25 bucks. I think I got a ticket for 12 bucks from somebody, wow. and I went in. And I think I would have seen it. I, I, it's amazing. I wear it and I'm like, I have no idea. And I see these fucking white guys come, who the fuck are these assholes? Because I had no concept. And yeah. these guys, Madison Square Garden lost their shit. Lost their shit. Everybody knew. Everybody knew this song. And when Run DMC came out, holy motherfucker. It was like, wow. holy. And, and all these white kids, and I was shocked. Didn't yeah, you hold the words? Didn't you hold the words? Didn't you hold the words for uh, the Beastie Boys? And then you hold the words for that. Just like, what the fuck is yep. this shit? Yep. It was a magical that was, time with that. That was stuff. like an eye opening shit to me. Yeah. I was like, dude, were they That's fucking like, saying tricky? Yeah. Yeah. I thought the fucking garden was gonna fucking collapse. I thought the <laughs> that shit was rocking. It was rocking, man. It was a fucking beast. Don't yeah. sleep till Brooklyn. I mean, it was, it's, dude. That was one of the most electrifying show. Other than watching the rock go to Madison Square Garden and say, I am back home. <laughs> That's it. But that shit was holy shit. That was incredible. And 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 I and I and I got I got a teacher for the concert, and I got a book. With, uh, with, with, with 20 and whatever, yeah, like it was yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. I gotta see if I still have it. it gotta be yeah, worth something. Nobody, uh, nobody does tour books anymore uh, at these big shows. It's too bad. Um, one thing they did at this time when this album came out is they started their own label called uh, Grand Royale. Grand Royale. Okay, and they would sign all different kinds of acts. So one was Jackson, who was on that label. Uh, Sean Lennon, John, John Lennon's son was on that label. I remember that shit, Jackson. What did Usher Jackson? That's so familiar. They had, yeah, they, had, they, had, they, had they had a couple of songs. Yeah, it wasn't huge. But they had a one song that had a radio play. Was that a chick as a lead singer? I don't remember. Was it, uh, girl was the lead singer? Well, Jackson. Jackson. Well, girls. Uh, uh, Kate Sullenback, that was in the Beastie Boys, was in Lusty Jackson. Yes. Oh, yes. That's, that's the connection. That's the connection. Yeah. All right. So Kate Sullenback would play drums when they were a hardcore band. Yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, they also had um, At the Drive-In, was one of their big signs. Uh, at the Drive-In. At the Drive-In, right, right, right. 
Well, they also had a magazine called Grand Royal Magazine in 1993. They would have all kinds of shit in there, everything from Bruce Lee information, okay? To, you know, I uh, never realized that until I was reading that. I was shocked by that. George Clinton and all kinds of people. Yeah, I mean, it, that was a mag it didn't last that long. It was a few years, I think. Three years? Yeah. Now, in 1994, they would release Ill Communication. And this is when I kind of tuned back in a little bit with them, because when I saw the video for Sabotage, okay, which was a single of that, I went, holy shit. Not only was it a good song, okay, the video was fucking hilarious because it spoofed like 70s cop shows yeah. and stuff, which I love. Okay. And then the whole thing, I mean, then there was the, I don't know if you remember the Beavis and Butthead bit when, yeah. when they when they play in Sabotage, yeah. right? And there's the one guy that's named Cochesey, yeah. and, and, and Beavis is like, Cochise, Cochise, Cochise. <laughs> Oh, I remember that shit. Yeah. Which one too had the Alter Ego and the Fandom Rock had like, because he played himself as a Fandom Blower and like, ended up like being a character like, he played Crash Yes, 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 yes. Like a number one fan or something like that. Yeah. Again, these guys were ahead of the curve because that was 94. And if you remember, by like 96, 97, there was like this resurgence of like 70s. Yeah. Okay. And they were ahead of the game with that. You know, so that was cool. Um, other tracks off that album. Get It Together. Get It Together. Short right. Shot. Okay. Short shot. That album will go triple platinum. Yeah, that was a great album. Yep. yep. Same year. They went back to their roots and they released something called The Same Old Bullshit. Yeah. Or I can see the Some Old Bullshit. Okay, same. All right, now, it was all a lot of like early punk stuff that they did. All right. And that album would make it to number 46. What do we call it? That would make it to number 46 on the Billboard chart. Not bad for old stuff. Some old stuff. They played the Lollapalooza tour that year with Smashing Pumpkins. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That was the first one, right? Yeah, I think it was on the second one, maybe. Yeah. Hey, right, right. Mike, what do you think if we did a show on like concert venue like that? Like Lollapalooza? Different, different events yeah, over the years? With, like, yeah. Some people in it. And we can start with Woodstock and walk our way from Live Aid to all the other shit. Even they, they got the I, I, would, I, the I, would, mostly, I would mostly shit on Woodstock. Oh, we can shit okay. on it too. I would shit on it because everybody I ever met, old fuckers that I met, that, that been to Woodstock, they hated said, it. said it was two days of fucking misery. <laughs> <All right. laughs> anybody that looks at Woodstock and goes, oh yeah, it's great. Imagine being there for all those days in the mud and the rain, waiting for Jimi Hendrix to come on at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I mean, unless you were there and you were tripping for like three days in a row, I, I can't see how you could deal with it. I would have had some good ass back in those days. I would have been tripping balls and having a time of my life. Huh? Don't eat the brown acid. <laughs> so they were touring like crazy now. Yeah. Okay. And uh, this was the time when, when Adam Yao would be starting to become more active politically. He was interested in that free to bet. Yeah, free to bet. Okay. Uh, that was 1996. He had a two day festival he arranged. In Golden Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, yeah. it's arranged for it was like, a, it was like the biggest concert since Live Aid. Yes. Do they right. still do it to today, or did they stop? No, the last one was no. in 2012. No, after he died, that was the end of it. Then. I'm surprised. I don't think anybody gives a fuck about Tibet. Anymore. I'm surprised that they do. Get shot in the street if you do. Well, oh, in China, yeah. in China. In China. Yeah, in China. I'm surprised they haven't. Nobody has taken that love and do it like a tribute to him. They could have kept it going. Yeah, I mean, Beastie Boys kind of like, uh, you know, since he died, they, they, just, they, just, kinda, they just disbanded. Yeah. And that's really it. Um, they would be still torn again. They would go to South America. They would play uh, South Asia for the first time in that year. Now, in 1995, they went and they made a punk hardcore record. Yep, they did. Out of the ball. It's called Aglio e Olio, and it's 11 songs in 14 minutes. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect for my attention span. Okay. I actually bought this album, okay, and I listened to it a couple of times, five or six times over the years, and 
It's great. It's good. In fact, I threw it on today. I haven't listened to it in a while. I tell you, it's good. And, and, and I'm like, okay, you know, this is what they were doing. I just always wondered if, like, who was buying that? Like, who bought that besides me? Because you, know, you know who probably bought that? People that like that John that figured out this is going back to the roots and remember him. How did they say? I don't think, I don't think the record did it too much of a splash. No, it didn't. It didn't really. But there, there was a song on there called Deal With It. That I thought was pretty cool. Uh, a song called Brand New. That was pretty cool. I mean, probably the people that like, like Sabotage and Talk Living. And, and yeah, like, some uh, of the stuff that's like guitars. Yeah, and that, was, that was in their catalog. To me, I got to tell you, my favorite song is Sabotage. And I loved it when they did the yes. new Star Trek, the three Star and, and Trek. They, Kirk, they put but, that song yeah. in it. Like when they opened it, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah when, Kirk, when Kirk is like racing in that car. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and he's playing and he jumps out and the car goes off the cliff. And, and there's another Paul, doesn't Spock say that's like the worst song ever? No, in the, 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 the third one, they use yeah. it to stop the alien race from invading. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, said, yeah, yeah. what did they call this? This is terrible. This is the worst, song, is the worst ever. song ever. I can't believe you humans listen to this thing. <laughs> I think that song was used in all three of the Star Trek films. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Now, July of 1998, they would come out with another album called uh, Hello Nasty. And on that album, they actually added another member to the band, a guy named Mix Master Mike. Uh, it was an experimental record. It actually went to number one. Okay. Uh, different than other shit they ever did. At that point, uh, they had been living in L.A. for a lot of years. I think after the first album, they moved out there. But this was when Adam Young came back. Yeah, because they recorded it. They had like, they built out a studio on Mott Street. Yes. And they recorded yes. it in the basement. Yes. It's actually in the uh, 3MTs and 1DJ video. Right. Oh, yeah. You see, you see them down there. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. This album being experimental, whatever it was, got to number one, and they would win a Grammy in 1999 for this album. Uh, best alternative music album. Yeah. Which, I gotta mention, I think this is fucking great in a way, because they were crossing all kinds of genres. Yeah. When you think of the Beastie Boys, you think of a rap band. Yeah. Really. But they were getting lumped in in the late 90s into this alternative music scene. I'm not sure if it really suited them or not. Do you think? I mean, so. You know what? You talk a little bit about my experience. Like, Hell yeah. Nasty was probably one of the first albums I bought, like, personally, because I was one I know. Okay. I was like 11 or 12 at the time. I had, like, actual money to spend. And yeah. I was like, you know, these two boys obviously you see them on, like, te television here, like, the early shit. Yes. And then, like, you had, like, a hand down copy or whatever. Right. Uh, Oakland Beach, you check your head, obviously, like, videos. Check your head, it's great. Yeah. But, like, yeah. So, like, Hell Nasty. As a kid, like listening to that, expecting one thing, getting multiple things at the same time, and yeah. being into like that type of sound, that kind of it's my head. Right. You know, you be, being being a being a, a younger than us, okay, it's interesting to hear your point of view of all this because I remember a time when there was no rap. Yeah. So my perspective is always like. Okay, here's a new genre that I gotta figure out. Okay, as a music fan, right? You were born into it. Yeah. Okay. So that's a very interesting perspective. Um, that album, what I remember from it the most was the Intergalactic, video, which I thought was fucking cool. I, I, I dug it. I, I love, I love that song. Intergalactic. That was great. You know what's funny about them? You know what the problem was with the Beastie, with the Beastie Boy? They were so ahead of the fucking, they were so ahead of the curve that people have problems putting certain genres. Oh, are they rap? Oh, are they alternative? Are they this? Are they that? They, 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 every single album, every single album was a lot different than the other album. They would add some element that you'd be like, but you always knew it was that. But you always knew it was that. You always knew it was that. That that kind of like mirrors. My attitude towards a lot of music that I like is that yeah. it's not so much about a genre because I like you know multiple genres. It's yeah. more about like the, the singularness of the artists and how they do what they do. Yeah. Like, the Beastie Boys sound like the Beastie Boys. Yeah. Whether they're no a band they're or rap. Right. To me, I'm gonna shit on Hair Rock just for a second. Okay. Here's the problem with Hair Rock. They will take out this hardcore fucking kick ass song and then they will take out the love battle. What the fuck was that about? 
Where the fuck were you playing this great fucking hardcore song? Yeah. And then you played that said, Oh my wife just it was like fucking terrible country music for her band. I, and these idiot marks to today, they still fucking got the long hair, the leather jacket. You mean bands like, you mean bands like Poison? Oh Show my god, that, yes. That, every rose has its own. <laughs> yeah, like that's Eric horrible. Cole, man. That's horrible. A, that, yeah. Fucking, yeah. um... That, that's a genre that... Uh, a Monty Crew. Like, yeah, they, 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 Monty Crew did it. It wasn't much good. Monty Crew did it too. Yeah. All these assholes did it. Yeah. Even Cinderella, Brad, what the fuck about Joby? I think, I think... They you guys like, are a bunch of assholes. You know, so like, the record company would tell these fans, look, you got to do a ballad because you got to get the little girls, for the girls to listen to it by the records. Because girls don't want to hear you singing hard shit, getting drunk and all that shit. They want to hear you saying, oh, they love you and all that stuff. You know? <laughs> like, I think, you know, like, I think we would still be kind of stuck in that, in that. We, we went to a different, like, road as a... If it wasn't for the Beastie Boys. It wasn't for the Beastie Boys. <laughs> <laughs> You know, well, you're rapper, right in a way. It, it, it brought it back to be like, okay, you don't need to rely on, on the label to, to yeah. get record. You just need a four track recording device. And right, and do your thing. And, and right, right, right. And, and it was all, you know, DIY. Yeah, right. it, was, it, was, it, was, it was the punk attitude yeah. brought to a hip hop genre. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now, in 1999, they would uh, win an MTV Music Award for Best Hip Hop Video for Intergalactic. That was, cool a, video. that was a great video. It was at the MTV ceremony for that, that Adam Yao. And I remember watching this. Uh, he basically addressed the crowd and said something like, you know, we got to stop treating Muslims badly. And not all Muslims are terrorists. Oh yeah. You know, and it was it was right after the African embassies were bombed in '99. Uh, I remember going like, all right, you know, now, now you now you're like he got shit on that. For yeah. That. He got shit not, on not that. Not that I think Muslims are terrorists, but I'm saying I just think like when when people get political at that when they're at that level, it always kind of like turns me off in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, uh, I guess they they want to do it because they they have the voice to, to say what they want. But usually to me it's kind of like the fuck, just make a fucking record. You know what I mean? You know what? I think my first Rossi rant show is going to be about we fucking, are the world. No, it's about fucking <laughs> idiot artists or musician or fucking rock star, fucking TV star. Talk about the political view. Not, not, if you want me only, to like you, yeah. don't talk about it. Shut yeah. the fuck up. And, and not only did he bitch about. The way he felt Muslims were being treated, he bitched about people being like raped, and fucking sexually harassed at Woodstock nuts. Okay. And that was a little different. But but the thing is, now that was a shit show. But he blamed the bands. I don't know. Was it the band's fault that that happened? Like, no. More like it's not the band. He said they didn't. They didn't pay enough attention to. But it was the band's fault that security. Well, they hired the security. I mean, it should be the, the event for those. It is. I would think. Right? But I'm, I mean, I don't know what the logistics are. Yeah, I mean, but I remember. They they think like about what. Like think about what's happening there. Everybody's using drugs. Everybody's fucked up. What do you think's gonna happen? There's a few yeah. fucking bad apples in the front of the There's a few yeah, bad apples a bunch of assholes. You know, That's it. I mean, you go back, watch the Gimme Shelter movie with the Stones. They use the fucking Hell's Angels as security. Yeah. Duh. That's fucking stupid. And some pimp got killed. You know what I mean? and, and then somebody got killed. But that, guy, but that guy also had a gun. Yeah. Okay, you can see it in the, and when they do yeah. the stop action, you can see the gun. We should do a show about that movie. Yeah, he got lumped yeah. up. Yeah. Oh, boy, did he get lumped up. <laughs> They said that when, when when he got stabbed by the Hell's Angel, he made a hole like this big in his fucking back. Wow, gigantic. He died right right there. Um, in the early days of the internet, we were talking 98, 99, uh, Beastie Boys had a website. Yeah. They were one of the first people to actually have downloads of their songs. Now, Nobody really, this is uncharted territory at the time. Nobody knew where to go with this. But Capitol Records was like, fuck that. And they pulled them off their website. Okay? So now you can only get Beastie Boys downloaded on the Beastie Boys site, not on the Capitol Records. Yeah. Not, I don't know what that meant, but they, they had a problem with it. Dude, think, 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 about, think about it again. They're ahead of their time. Yeah. Downloading. Yeah, like, well, what do we do now with Apple? Remember, remember, who, <laughs> remember who also was doing that at the same time? Who? Bowie. 
Oh yeah, Bowie, well, that's Bowie's right. website, you can get like all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah, just confused about what we talk about the internet. Yeah. Like the 99 yeah. Yeah. like today should be like, I don't think you guys are going to understand what this is going to be. Yeah, they, they yeah. saw the future, you know. Uh, 1999, there will be a two CD anthology uh, that would come out on billboards. Uh, there was a song on there called Alive, and that got to number 11 on the modern rock charts. What the hell does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> but they were getting lumped in again with the alternative music scene. In 2000, there would be a rhyme and reason tour scheduled. But unfortunately, uh, Mike D would get hurt in a uh, bicycle accident and he needed surgery and they couldn't do that tour. Oh, I kind of that, remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah and they, and they have so dates yeah. stuff scheduled. I think like Buster Rhymes was on that tour and Rage, Rage Against the Machine before they broke off, like that, that first tour. It uh, at this point that uh, they organized the uh, New Yorkers Against Violence concert. This was right after the September 11th attacks. Uh, there was a couple of shows related to that where they raised money. Uh, in 2002, Adam Yao would open a studio in downtown Manhattan, right? And it was called Oscilloscope Laboratories. And they were going to make movies there, they were going to make records there, it was everything. Everything, yeah. They, re they released a protest song called In a World Gone Mad. And it was basically protesting the war in Iraq in 2003. Uh, I was tuning out about it. Yeah. Uh, they were associate. They were starting to associate with like MoveOn.org and other groups like that that were involved in that laboratory studio. Uh, also, the 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 safe Tibet stuff was still going on. Morrowitz is still very into that. Yeah. Um, they would come out in 2000. They would come out with uh, the Five Burrows album. Okay. And that was released June 15th of that year. You had a single poem. Should should check it out. I would never check it out. But you know, yeah. I really didn't care for them. I didn't. After I, that. I didn't like them that much. I really anymore. didn't care for them after yeah, that. Really were you, were you listening to Yeah, I was, but yeah. I, I think actually, like... How did that album do that? I mean, I think it debuted number one, so... It went to number, to number one. one. Number one. one. That song, the single, went to number one on the U.S. modern yeah. rock really song. It, it was a... Alternative kind of right. thing, right? So it, it, it was that. kind of like a continuation of what you saw starting to hella nasty when it started. Like, yeah. yeah. More like funk and what, jazz. What, and one thing I thought was interesting with that album is that they got in trouble because if you put the CD... In there, in, in, your, in, your, in your computer, if you listen to it, there was spyware. <laughs> there was an accusation that they put spyware on it. It went back and forth in the courts. They said they didn't do it, so who knows. But apparently there were some people that had problems with that. Uh, it'll be a few more years now. They, they kind of would go on a bit of a hiatus. But in 2007, they would come out with the Big Song album, which is an, an instrumental. That was album. a good album. Okay. They would win a Grammy for that. That was great. Uh, that was best, I thought that was great. Best that was a good, good album. Yeah. Were they sampling a lot on that? No, no it's it just beats, like, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I don't remember hearing it. I don't think I ever heard that. I don't think they released any singles off of it for yeah. That was just a hell of a good. You know what? Well, you know, I yeah. didn't care for the other album that you talk about. I think I was tuning them out by then. That was a, to the Five Boroughs. Yeah, Five Boroughs. I didn't yeah. care, but this well, isn't there album a song was really good. On that Five Boroughs, where all they do is just like name check things, like they just name yeah. check like so, locations. Open letter to NYC. Open letter, right? Right. right. That was like kind of like their post 9/11 like. To New York, oh, they were just name checking spots. Yeah. 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 So it kind of ran like this the guy fucking thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can tell it was a bag of shit. Bag of shit. <laughs> but hey, look, it did good for them. Uh, now, 2009, and I, I'm going to let you go on that. There would be the, the Hot Sauce Committee. Yes. And there was, this was the time when Adam Yao would be diagnosed with cancer. He had cancer of the saliva gland yeah. in, in his throat. Um, what's the story with this exactly? Because I, I, I was I am tuned out at this point, and I know that they were coming with a, a part one and a part two, yes. but only part two got released. Yes, yes, no. So, yeah, it's extremely hard to follow exactly 
what the real process was because they kind of had like a disjointed type of recording session because of the diagnosis and everyone yeah. kind of like also had their own projects going on. So they were, I think, in the habit of like recording parts of these songs separately and then sending each other the demo reels and then like right. recording over it. And it ended up being the fact that they had a lot of pieces of songs but not a lot of complete songs. So they wanted to release it almost like a, a, a box set, you know? Yeah. We're gonna call it like a double album. You know, that we sell together. them together in one package. Yeah. Okay. Long story short, I think what ended up happening is that they were advertising that they're gonna release part one and then part two would eventually be released shortly thereafter. So right. it's not gonna be a package with two separate albums. But then what ended up happening is that they after they already released uh, track listing and artwork for Hot Sauce Committee Part 1, they ended up pulling the release and then saying, actually, we're going to release Committee for Hot, Hot, Hot Sauce Committee Part 2, but it's going to have all the songs that we're going to be on Hot Sauce Committee Part 1. All right. So when you're listening to Hot Sauce Committee Part 2, it's actually Hot Sauce Committee Part 1. And then, you know, the, all the rest of the songs are... But, you know, but unfortunately, unfortunately, these things would never be released. Yes. And, you know, eventually, right, nothing came out. Yeah. Alright, um, in 2011, they would get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yep. And Mike D and, uh, and Horowitz would be there. And, uh, they've had a speech prepared by Adam Yao, who unfortunately was too sick to come. Uh, basically had something prepared ahead of time. Now, in May of May 4th of 2012, Adam Yao would pass away from his cancer. I remember that. That was terrible, and, yeah. I remember being like, oh man, and he was only like 47 years old. Yeah. You know, just, you didn't see that coming, you know, you know what I'm saying? They had the painter MCA around the corner, which they just took off. Yeah, right, that was on the wall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they also had um, they also had a pole boutique. Somebody do painted a yeah, pole boutique on the Yeah. They also uh, they renamed the playground. Oh yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, in June of that year, about a month after Adam passed away, um, Mike D would officially confirm that the Beach Boys were disbanded, yeah. and that was the end of it. Rob, take care. So, a lot of years, uh, you're talking uh, 30 years, basically, that they existed. Uh, as, either as a punk hardcore and mostly as a as a rap band, um, definitely. I mean, they made their mark. Oh, that's there's, there's, there's no doubt. Their they made their mark. Um, I want to do a, a song of the week, okay? And I'm gonna ask you if you could pick a song by the Beastie Boys as your all-time favorite. Yeah, you know, what would it be? I would have to say. Running past the bike, to be honest, or uh, switch on. Which one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And if you could pick an album, to me it was Sabotage. No, Sabotage. no, no, an album. An album. An album. I would have to say I, I love um I love the one that had Intergalactic Planetary was great. You don't think you would say Paul's Boutique? I love. I think Paul Boutique is it's a. I think is that it, is, is it, the it, best album. Is it your favorite? It, no, I think, you know what, let me take that back. I love the Instagram acting, but Paul Boutique oh. was a masterpiece. Yeah. Paul Boutique was a, a, Paul Boutique I think was the album that made them rethink their career. But they thought they took out a shit album, it was a great album. So it still sold yeah. two million copies. Yeah, the but second they, album. Yeah. But they started rethinking, like, what the fuck are we doing? And then they did some other shit. But I think, I think that's what the Beastie World, they took risks. But Paul Boutique was good. They but took to, a lot of risks. But to with me, uh, and I'm gonna go. To me, my favorite song there is is Tigalati. I thought it's your favorite that, song. That is a okay. fucking favorite song. Yeah. And to me, if, uh, between that and Sabotage, that's what I, I would. I would pick. Of. I would pick Sabotage. Oh, uh, I would actually pick two songs because I would want to break it down between the later period yeah. and the early okay. period. I would say later period Sabotage, and you're gonna laugh. Early period, Paul Revere. Okay. Uh, I, I, whatever, Paul I mean, Revere. because it's me so, and my pony in the cold of beer, yeah! Paul Revere, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, big people. <laughs> I feel like earlier for Slayer, I would be. 
Oh my God, dude, that, yeah, that, that, you know what? That song, that was a great song. That's yeah. another. You know, when you start talking, you, you, you're like, holy shit, but that was a fucking great song. Because I remember everybody singing that song, Where We'll Come On. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, we're going to do a, uh, a little shout out right now to somebody, okay? Uh, there used to be a, the Violators. They are a old school punk band from New York City. used to play Max in Kansas City a lot and other places. And uh, they had a single called The New York Ripper. That single has now been re-released on Rave Up Records. I suggest you all look it up. And I want to give a shout out to Steve Hadon. He gave me the cool ass shirt. Nice shirt. Can you see the back? Can you see the back? Yeah. Violator. Violator. All right. Cool. I had to move the dredge. Okay. <laughs> Either way. And I want to give a shout out to him. He's been great. Uh, we've been talking online and stuff. And fantastic guy. Uh, we're going to talk about some upcoming shows. All right. November 7th this week, the Carvels are playing pianos over on Ludlow Street. Ooh, that's actually... That, that's, a good, that's a good little place. That's uh, a nice venue, too. Yeah. November 9th, we got Robert Gordon is playing my father's place out in Roslyn on Long Island. We just saw him a few months ago. Yeah, he was great. Uh, December 15th, Agnostic Front is playing with Sick of It All at Kingslands in Brooklyn. Oh, I will go there, but that's my birthday day, so that's no. December 15th is your birthday? Yes. That's right, you're in December. We're having a little party here, a little oh, yeah. Toys for uh, Todd's for Todd's that's, Now, we will be lumped up. Yeah, we, we will, will be not make up. that show. <laughs> okay. January 16th, oh, wait, before that, December 28th, check out Guar at Warsaw. Ooh. Warsaw. Playing the Warsaw. Okay. That, that's where, a show where, I'll be that's, in. That's, where, that's, that's, where, wear old clothes because you will be drenched in jello blood. Okay? <laughs> and other shit. Wet. You'll be very wet. Yeah. Let's hope uh, don't mess your clothes. Focus or something. Yeah. <laughs> Guar is always entertaining. Uh, January 16th. Now, two months away. Uh, the Addicts are playing the uh, Gramercy <coughs> Theater on 23rd Street. That's they're, a nice they're, a great, they're a great band, and it's a good, good location. That's a great yes. band. Definitely. Definitely. You know who I saw there? They, uh, they did a reunion show. Uh, uh, like, like, this, is, this is weeks and weeks. They did like a reunion show, and um, Gramercy... Uh, I think it was Stone Temple Pilot that did like a little reunion show before Without this guy died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they did at Gramercy, and that's like a great venue to see. I, I, I've seen the Super Suckers there. I've seen Michael Monroe from Hanoi Rocks there. Uh, Marky Ramon plays there a lot. I think he's actually playing in December as well. I'll get back to you about that. He does like a Christmas show type thing. That's all I got today, man. So, hey, Darren. Hey, Darren. How can people reach you? What email? You have an email? People have a contact. You can hit me up on Twitter at Live Like Memorex. What's that? Live Like Memorex. Live Like Memorex, okay. On Twitter, alright. Rob, how can we get you? You can get me on any Twitter, Facebook, Chinese book. Uh, the man down the corner, the old Chinese restaurant in the corner. You could get me anywhere. Just follow me. Opium Dad. At Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> That's on my special trip to China. <laughs> Any opium dead around, you'll find it around. <laughs> but you can find me anywhere, and just look up Getting Lumped Up, and you will get a ton of contact. Also, join us on YouTube. We need subscribers, yes. subscribers, okay. subscribers. Getting over. Lumped Up. Getting Lumped Up. Put that into the YouTube search engine. You'll see this guy's face. Yeah. And sign up, subscribe, hit like. If you want to find me, I'm all over the place. Rocker Mike 212 on Instagram. Rocker Mike 212. If you want to find me on Twitter, tweet me. I'm Rocker Mike 3. And if you want to find me on Facebook, as long as Zuckerberg isn't mad at me, I'm there. And it's under Michael Baker. He doesn't have me in jail. Okay? Love you all, people. And remember, don't get drunk. Get up, up. Thank you. Fuck you. Have a nice day. Right. Thank you and fuck you. <laughs>